All right, everybody, welcome back to this discussion of Tehanu. In this video, I want to talk about chapters 7, 8, and 9. And before I get going, I want to briefly remark on Moss. And something is becoming more clear to me as I read this, is that Moss's character is, I think, a sympathetic take on the evil witch trope. Right? Moss is cunning. Moss is deceptive and conniving. But this book is trying to make the point that Moss has been excluded, in a sense, from society. She is resentful at the people who have done this to her. So as chapter 7 gets going, we have this deputation that arrives from Havnor in the port. And when Ged hears about this ship that has arrived, he's mortified because he can no longer face those men with power without his own power. He has no status. For him, it's just a social indignity. So there's a point where Ged and Tanar are talking, and Ged expresses that he wishes he would have died in the drylands. A lot of this chapter felt like Tanar's attempt to try and understand where Ged's shame and humiliation come from. And ultimately, she struggles to do this. So this whole chapter felt like this rumination on power. And, you know, surprise, surprise, the idea that men and women are going to think about power differently. And so as Ged is preparing to flee the emissaries that are coming in from Havnor, Ged is telling Tanara, well, he wishes that she would have used her power once he left her with Ogian. And so on page 106, we get this. This is Tanara speaking. Well, then, tell me. What should I have done with my power and the knowledge Ojin tried to teach me? Ged says, use it. How? As the art magic is used. By whom? Wizards, he said a little painfully. And I think Ged here flinches at wizards because he's no longer one. But that's not what Tanar meant when she said by whom. She meant men. She goes on to say, magic means the skills, the arts of wizards, of mages. And I want to emphasize that when Tanara is saying wizards and mages, she's implying these are men. What else would it mean, Ged says? Is that all it could ever mean? And I thought that was a really interesting conversation. But what she means is that, is there any other possible way to conceive of using the art magic? Not using it as warriors. Could you use it differently? And one of the things I'm interested to see how it unfolds is, what is the goal with Theru? What is the objective? Because it sounded like Ojin wanted Theru trained in the art magic for power. And this was a really cool conversation. There were a lot of interesting points and topics discussed. And I just really am liking Ged and Tanar's interactions here. But there was another interesting point that gets dropped. that We learned that Ojin would have never wanted to have trained a girl had Ged not asked for it. He did that to appease Ged. So with the help of Tanar and Moss, Ged flees to Moss's cottage as the men from Havnor arrive, and they want to know Ged's whereabouts. And they are sort of flippant in their reactions to some of Tanar's evasiveness and her equivocations. And even one of them seemed a bit impolite. But on the whole, I think she recognizes that they are civil. So right at the beginning of chapter 8, we get another very enigmatic conversation with Moss. It's Tanar and Moss talking. Once again, I kind of had to read through this a few times to figure out what was going on. But basically, I think the gist is that in order to control lust, mages will put spells on themselves, but I think it affects those around them. So in general, wizards are celibate. But ever since Ged has lost his powers, he hasn't been able to magically suppress temptations. And from what I can gather, though the temptations of those around him as well. But then we also see that maybe Dinar has some feelings for Ged because she realizes that she misses him and she's waiting for him to come through the door. So a little bit after this, still in chapter eight, Moss and Tanar are still conversing. They start talking about, once again, the differences between men and women. And this time, the conversation helped to clarify the difference 
an opinion between Tanar and Moss. Moss seems to believe that men and women are just different. A man gives, a woman takes in. And this is a very simplistic and reductionist worldview. I think what she's missing is that it doesn't accurately describe the complexity of human minds. But in some way, it does accurately describe the world that she's seeing. But the problem is that's a social thing or a way of organizing society. And it also doesn't even describe the difference between the art magic between men and women, which is one of the points Tanar presses her on. You know, she asks her, did you give up your power when you were with a man? And Moss is like, no. And then Tanar basically says, well, I think we just make up all these differences. And Tanar's main point is, unless the art magic, unless the actual power is different, aren't we just making this up? Moss thinks that men are just much more powerful. And she has this analogy that makes it a little more clear between the roots and the tree analogy between men and women. But she just thinks men are more powerful, but they sort of fade out very quickly. Whereas women can't dish out as much, but they can handle a lot. They can endure and they can survive. But there's also a strong finality to this scene because at the end, Tanar shows Moss affection. And Moss is taken aback. And this is something that Moss has likely been denied. And in some way, what Tanar is saying is that she accepts her, even though Moz has ruined her own reputation. There are a few more happenings. You know, Tanar goes and meets with the Weaver fan, and he shows her a fan. So near the end of chapter 8, there's this man that starts stalking Tanar and Theru. And honestly, the tension really picked up. All, from chapter 8 all the way through to the end of chapter 9, the tension picked up. It kind of started to feel like, a creepy thriller. So Tanar, at the beginning of chapter 9, treks up to the mansion house of the Lord of Rialbi, and she wants to alert people to the presence of the man that's been stalking her. And she runs into a wizard named Aspen. And Aspen is the same wizard from earlier who imperiously flicked the charm pouch from Ogian's hand. And when Tanar tells Aspen that there's this man named Handy who is a thief and maybe worse, he just loses control. And he makes this comment about women's tongues being worse than actual thieves. And then he demeans Theru. I don't know if he's a good guy. Hard to tell. But her ability to stand up to him in this scene, the way it unfolded, was pretty badass and pretty heroic. And all of chapter 9 was just really tense and riveting like this. And after this heroic stand of Tanar's, Aspen starts muttering a curse. And two of the men from Havnor show up, and one genuflex, and praises Tanar right there in front of Aspen. And so he just shuts up. And then Tanar leaves, and you know the men from Havnor walk back up to the mansion with Aspen. So after this confrontation with Aspen, Tanar returns to the house. And almost immediately, her mental state declines. And she blames herself for being a woman. She calls herself stupid. And she begins to call herself dark and refers to herself as a shadow. And we learn a page later that what was going on here was that in this moment, she reawakens Ara because this is the type of life Ara grew up in. Dark, shadow, this is where Ara feels at home. And what she realizes is that she had walked into a curse. But once she recognizes this, she's able to break the curse. And she goes outside and yells at Aspen. And then there's this singeing smell. And I think that singeing smell is the curse being broken. So a few things happen, but then just a few pages later, Tanar returns to the homestead and realizes that it's been broken into. And so their privacy has been invaded. But at the same time, she walks right into another curse that's been put on the homestead. And she quickly realizes that she can't think, right? She's confused. But she realizes that the curse deals with the predominant language, which is Hardy. So she stops speaking it and she stops thinking in it. And she returns to Kargish and also once again reawakens Ara. And since this curse deals with language and thinking, Ara is comfortable in silence and in the dark, and so able to evade 
the curse. And one of the results of this curse is as she's talking to Heather, she just belittles her, demeans her. But the curse and the confusion and disorientation it brings to Nar, I think it's also, it's supposed to lead her right to Aspen. I think she's supposed to get anxious and not think through what's going on and walk right into Aspen. But because she's able to reawaken Ara and avoid some of the curse or evade it, she's able to think through carefully of how to evade Aspen on her way down the mountain. So they descend down into Gokport. They encounter Handy, Handy spots them, and then chases them all the way to the port. And Tanar escapes by getting on this boat. But the chapter sort of ends, so we don't know what's going to happen after that. But yeah, this last chapter here, uh, chapter 9, was very tense. And I really like the way it picked up. And yeah, as always, I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you on the next one. Peace.